change, so it's going to be our the affects of change and influences. Um, and this PowerPoint will have to uh, have a bit of that it's, it's new, and so we're doing multiple things. You can hear me, by the way, because I use this as well, but that would be very difficult. Everyone, okay? Can you hear me? Well, for me, for, for the recording as well, it could be great. Oh, okay. <laughs> Alright, so as we know, Deleuze is interested in exploring the emergence of thought itself. And the event whereby sense is rested from the mute, imminent field of sensation and forces. Quote, that blind, acephalic, aphasic, and alienatory original point which designates the impossibility of thinking that is thought, that point where powerlessness is transmuted into power. This event occurs when something forces our faculties to communicate their intensive differences between one another, producing a phenomenal flash, the sudden shock of sensation. Also, Deleuze associates this with uh, the being of the sensible, the sentiendum, and the affect. And the contemplation of the affect uh, has proliferated discussions of the nature of affect and, and how art might intervene upon philosophy disrupting and opening a space for thought to become otherwise. Thus, provocation becomes an ethical imperative and thinking a kind of poesis that begins with affective encounters. And what follows, I suggest that this provocation of thought requires a precursory activity to develop a sensitivity to eminence and affect, which puts us in a kind of circular predicament. What kinds of activities, affects, and encounters can open a space whereby this sensitivity arises in order that the very processes and mobility of thinking can get off the ground in the first place? Preliminarily, we can answer by saying that we are interested in the creation of new affects, blocks of sensation, which have a potential to affect and change the flows and cadences of present configurations. This is the aesthetic philosophical intersection that I want to explore. But while preparing this text, I realized that I would have to address the problematic of an unreflected exuberance about the creative potential of art and affect, even my own, which prompts me to want to situate this discussion in relation to our present relationship with art and affect, to conduct something of a critical historical analysis. What I'm interested in is what these affects can do for us now, to develop a sense of what a thought from the outside which privileges affect and imminence could be given our present day interaction with an indebtedness to an effectively saturated world. Therefore, the more nuanced question is what affects do we need?
What also becomes clear is that affect in and of itself is no panacea. It isn't the case that affects can save us from an over-intellectualized, over-rationalized world, or that they will necessarily be agents of change in our perceptions or behavior. Because affect has already become the mode of exchange in our current economy. In fact, the problem is much deeper. The oversaturation of affect actually means that we have become impervious to its effects. In order to think through these issues, Colbert calls upon the work of Deleuze and Guattari as thinkers who offer, quote, a complex history of the relation between brain, body, intellect, and affect. While she is sympathetic to their work to uncover the power of or force of affect and its centrality in human experience, she is also critical of the way that Deleuze's emphasis on affect has been reintegrated into discussions of affectivity. That is, of the assumption that the force of affect can be referred back to the affectivity of an organized lived body. In order to see beyond this, dile beyond this dilemma, we have to separate affect from affectivity in a more robust way. We need a concept of affect that will open a space for thinking beyond the immediacy of the ready and easy responses craved by our habituated bodies. We have to think the autonomy of the affect. This understanding of affect is certainly one that has its roots in, a kind, in a, the kind of autonomy that Deleuze ascribes to affects. He says in one's philosophy, affects go beyond the strength of those who undergo them. Yet, within the field of affect studies, the idea of autonomy is most notably associated with Brian Masumi's The Autonomy of Affect. His particular interpretation of the impersonal nature of affect is radical in that he is claiming that because of this immediate directness, we cannot even say that what we have experienced, that we have experienced affect, and implies that affect is something that works on us, through us, and over which there is absolutely no control. Returning to Colbert's demand for such an account of affect does not become, that does not become reintegrated into the lived body and affectivity as such, I want to argue that we need to develop an even more radical account of affect's autonomy. Namely, that affect exists independently of lived bodies altogether. Affects are materials, materially separate active entities that act upon our bodies, a view that I believe is latent within Deleuze's account, but because of our tendency to rely upon phenomenological description, is immediately lost. In other words, affect must be perceived as not incumbent upon the affectivity of the subject, but rather as the auto an autonomous monument comprised of circuits of force which stand alone outside of the body. Of course, this concept is indebted to Deleuze, for whom affect suggests lots of sensation, which are encountered rather than produced by us, the kind that acts as a provocation of thought. But to really underscore the autonomy, to really underscore the autonomy of the affect, it is important to remember Spinoza's influence on Deleuze's understanding of affect. Deleuze notes that in ethics, one finds two words dealing with affection, affectio and affectus. The inherent implicity of affect is that it is both an effect that a given object or practice has on its beholder, and also a self-sufficient, autonomous element in the world, which is not dependent upon a subject. Affect implies an utterly indispensable externality, itself a body or force impinging upon it, separate from our own. Affect, understood thus, opens us to a different temporality than the affections that we feel through the lived body, and that this temporal disconnect can destroy the immediacy of affection that is often associated with affect. Destroying affectivity opens the intensive potentials of affects because the former, quote, reduces all flows to a single system of exchange, end quote, and thus would destroy the efficiency of an economy that systematically and seamlessly incorporates and neutralizes affect by creating a system of hyperconsumption which paradoxically anesthetizes the social body from the force of affect itself. Thus, a more robust, autonomous concept of affect would potentially be, quote, a formation that would shatter the organism's emotive enclosure, end quote. It is th at this point that we must invoke the power of the artwork. Art presents an occasion to understand the nature of affect, uh, the nature of the affect is that which exists independent of our affective registers, yet has a unique potential to disrupt and recalibrate our expectations. So Lewis emphasizes the particular double potentiality of artwork and logical sensation and returns to this particular relation of affect and art. 
art and Norse philosophy, where he says explicitly, it should be said of all art that in relation to precepts and the visions they give us, artists are the presenters of affect, the inventors and creators of affect. They are not only creating the work, they give them to us and make us become through them. The important factor to remember about Deleuze's specific use of affect with respect to art is that it arises in works of art and passes through subjects who encounter them. As a passage, affect names the rising and falling of the body. As a matter of relations between bodies, affect extends beyond the human and beyond the human, and, and the beyond the human extends to us. According to Colebrook, quote, the power of art is not just to present this or that affect, but to bring us to an experience of any affect whatever, or effectuality, or that there is affect as such, unquote. Experiencing the artwork's capacity to create circuits of force beyond the viewer's own organic networks opens up a space of delay, frustrating immediate gratification. Posing this possibility of delay or interval becomes an occasion for thinking forces detached from the lived. Affect, rather than a response, the biological or internal model, must be considered from the perspective must be considered from the perspective of that by which we are confronted and having an entirely other and external nature. Affect becomes a genuine concept when it poses the possibility of thinking the delay or interval between the organism as a sensory motor apparatus and the world which that is, at least intellectually, mapped according to its own measure. It is in this gap between our lived bodies and affect as a standalone entity, which cannot be reduced to the lived, that a space opens up for us to experience the inhuman, the forces of eminent being from out of which we are generated. To Colbert's demand for thinking the temporality of affect as an interval that breaks up the immediacy of our subjective experience, I would add that this also allows us to imagine affect in spatial terms, as a place in which inhuman forces can arise or be illuminated. Rather than an empty space or gap between spaces, interval has to be thought as a temporal spatial dimension that is already full, a crystallization and slowing down of the space that is already present, with its myriad relations, dynamisms, and forces, which would correspond to Deleuze's understanding of the minor as, all, as a way of occupying space and transforming political space from within the already instantiated major institutions and hegemonic formations. Deleuze says, somewhat cryptically, that the artist is a kind of acrobat. Of course, acrobats are known for, some, for feats of great balance and contortion, taking their bodies to the most extreme limits and states of tension. The feat of the artist is to straddle the line between chaos and order to provide just enough consistency within the artwork for the myriad forces that are being captured to hold together while allowing them the most freedom possible. Thus, artworks are frames around chaos. As I have said elsewhere, the verb framing is a more adequate figure as it allows for thinking of the transversality of the frame, and the artwork is a kind of rhythm, rhythmic block of sensation that interacts with its surroundings. They are studies of intensity that make visible or amplify these forces themselves. that make visible or amplify the force of these forces themselves, forming what could be considered a pulsating space by purposefully flirting with and precariously maintaining the tension between these two tendencies. The artwork carves a territory, territory out of chaotic eminence, providing us a model of spatial interval that at the same time allows us to think interval as temporal delay. We encounter artworks as provocative, the combinatorial possibilities of which indicate the possibility of never before considered affects, which shock and confuse our easy consumption. Thus, these spaces of affect constitute an open, opening of eminence with which we can tarry to produce a sensitivity to this intensive and eminent realm that normally eludes us, or through which we clumsily pass unaware. Yet as I've emphasized, any naive exuberance for merely producing more affects or using affect to disrupt the economy fails to account for the oversaturated affective economy that has already routed and co-opted affect for its own purpose. Rather, we must consider the kind of affects that must be generated in order to allow us to engage with this new concept of affect. This is where philosophy intersects with art practice. So the former Greek finance minister, while giving a keynote speech at, Mos at the Moscow Biennale, said this, art must not be anodyne, culture cannot be decorative, artists should be feared by the power powerful in our society, 
If you're not, you're not doing your job properly. Now, rather than interpreting this as a straightforward call for artists to get political, it strikes me that it holds a more profound message as an implicit acknowledgement that art has a potential to open spaces of resistance and that it is uniquely poised to do so in a way that calls upon the artist in a mode of obligation. The exigency of the artist is amplified by a world that is practically cinched up by the overwhelming predominance of an all-encompassing capitalist economy that gobbles us and our affects up as quickly as they can be produced. Where and how can one escape from the singular economy of production if not in the intervals and spaces that artists uniquely open? Of course, this is a potential of art, not its essence, a potential that becomes an imperative if one desires a different future. Moreover, art practices are the place in which the space of affect can be reflectively engaged. It becomes an imperative to produce actors for themselves embodiments of delay or interval. What would they be? I would like to point to several artistic practices which create or promote particular kinds of affect as intervals in which forces of eminence overwhelm us. So this next section is called Silence and Indeterminacy. It may seem strange to speak of, affects, of the affects of silence and indeterminacy rather than the concepts of silence and indeterminacy, but this is exactly the precipice that must be traversed to shift towards an understanding of the autonomous power of affect. These affects in particular resist easy incorporation, and they are unlike other affects that can be immediately connected to our affective registers, our, as our tendency is to understand the products of art as reflecting our own anthropocentric registers and language of affectivity, sadness, happiness, such, those things. I want to claim that these particular affects provoke an experience of interval or delay required for shattering the subjective paradigm and thus initiating us into a realm of inhuman force and, in, and imminence which we have called the imperative of thought. The first I would like to consider are John Cage's explorations of silence and indeterminacy. Cage is perhaps most well known for developing chance operations, which are meant to eliminate the subjective intention involved in creation and highlight the aleatory as the main operator of the work. In his composition, Music of Changes, Cage cast the runes of, of the I Ching as a way of determining the structure of the composition. The aleatory was a feature of several movements within the avant-garde who were interested in challenging identity, rejecting intentional subject-oriented models, as well as the expressionist theories of the transmission of feeling through art. In Compositionist Process, Cage writes of this project, quote, The music of change is an, is an object more inhuman than human, since chance operations brought it into being, end quote. Indeed, Cage's method of producing the aleatory of art were taken up by many other art registers and set the tone for the development of performance art as a medium that embraced the spontaneity of live action, minimally directive scores or instructions, and the unpredictability of audience reactions as the barriers between performer and spectator were challenged. But what is interesting is that Cage situates the aleatory in a larger framework beyond the orchestration of chance operations that disrupt intentional structure. What he suggests is that his method of chance operations was a stage along the way to exploring something more profound than indeterminate, which is accessed by abandoning the structure, chance or otherwise, altogether. For this reason, Cage emphasizes the importance of the indeterminate with regard to performance. The purpose of indetermination is to bring about an unforeseen situation, and through chance, both chance operations do succeed in rendering the structure of a composition unknown from the beginning, the performance itself is foreseeable as it follows the edicts that, which, that the chance operations have determined. Maintaining that, quote, however, more essential than composing by means of chance operations, it seems to me it is composing in such a way that what one does is indeterminate of, of, it, of its performance. Cage recounts his necessary progression from the intentional incorporation of the aleatory to this process, to a process that is itself aleatory or indeterminate. Simultaneous to these experimental operations, Cage begins to develop a theory of silence, of which only one only becomes aware once the structure and the process of composition is disrupt, disrupted. Silence traditionally is seen to be the counterpoint part to sound, a model of duration. Silence then is thought of in terms of structure, the division of time lengths, partitioning of sound and silence. Cage at first attempts through the I Ching to make structure aleatory, which eliminates, quote, the presence of mind as a ruling factor. This leads him to understand that structure is not necessary at all. In the subsequent work, Music for Piano, he says that structure is no longer part of his composition. 
There is a purposelessness to it, an activity characterized by process alone. It is in this context that he asks, what happens to silence, or the mind's perception of it? Rather than a time lapse between sounds, where there is a predetermined structure or organically developing one, silence becomes something else, not silence at all, but sounds, the ambient sounds, the nature of things is unpredictable and changing. These sounds may be dependent upon to exist. The world teems with them and is in fact at no point free of them, Cage says. In experimental music, Cage insists that new music is nothing but sounds, those that are notated or those that are not. The notated, the non-notated sounds are, quote, silences, opening the doors of music to the sounds that happen to be in the environment, Silence is not voided, empty space. It is an affect that holds open a space for the unintentional ambient sounds that pre-exist us, that compose us, that exceed our activities. Quote, inherent silence is equivalent to the denial of the will. Therefore, end quote, silence is a, is a filled space, a space of plenitude that eradicates the priority of our cognitive and affective circuits, and which opens an interval for which arises independently therein. That is, concatenations of myriad forces of the external and yet eminent environment in which we are immersed. Two minutes left. Okay. The discovery of an unintentional <coughs> silence, something that breaks free of cognitive determination of thought, um, opens a space of materiality where forces arise or are already there. As Cage says, identification has been made with the material and actions of those are, are then those relevant to its nature. The composition becomes what arises in these spaces or intervals of silence thus accomplishing two things, the eradication of the intentional subject and the rendering of the performance completely indeterminate. Even more so, given that the performer, performers are something like inhuman ambient forces, one could say that this study in silence brings about the affect of the indeterminate. I have a section, and actually I think that I'm not going to be able to get to it, on fluxes and indeterminacy. Um, what I will say is that um, So um, the, per the performance that I wanted to um, highlight was Dick Higgins' uh, performance, A Thousand Symphonies, in which um, he instructs a New Jersey police officer to shoot a machine gun into a metal waste paper basket full of score um, paper. And then afterwards, the, through a process of, sort of, uh, of using, he uses the bullet holes as a way of creating the composition, and then an orchestra plays the orchestral music. And, uh, and for me, this is both um, indicative of the kind of um, plenitude that the, the, the blank score paper includes, and also the complete indeterminacy and the taking away of the subjective um, sort of uh, agency of the artist or composer. And so it's another example of indeterminacy. So I'll just read the final paragraph. Um, hopefully you can get from that. So, the assiduous incorporation of chance and indeterminacy into event scores and performance Culminating in our final example, evidence is the commitment of Fluxus to a contingent, unknowable future. Fluxus' challenge to conventional thinking on art and culture is connected to, maybe even speaks for a people, the rise of a counterculture community. Perhaps in revisiting this movement with special attention to the affects that it was able to release, we can engage a new potential, a space in which humanity can become that which understands itself from a new conception of eminence and affect. To become a people is sent, that is sensitive to open, dynamic systems of intensities, forces, and multiplicities. This is not to become inhuman, but to think beyond about the human, or being human differently, as an open possibility constantly bombarded by and in tandem with myriad forces and effective relations to other beings, human and otherwise. It is to adhere, to dwell even, in the same space, the interval, yet differently, and with an alternative relation to these potential connections and minor voices. Resistance is not loud. It happens in the cracks between time. The silence of increasing intensity, the eventual release of an amplified force that tears through spaces, speaks to a new sensibility, an open vulnerability to this outside, for which art prepares the way.
I guess let's talk more later. Okay, yeah. I mean, I, I think I may be pushing the envelope in, in terms of what to do these things, but that's okay. what I think. Makes all more sense, though. <laughs> Thank you. If there's one more short question, if possible. Yeah, uh, maybe a short question and a long answer. Oh, no. <laughs> And I was wondering, because fluxus very often is seen as something, uh, their events as being humorous. Yes. I wonder if you could talk about the relationship between affect and humor. Well, so it does seem, I mean, that's, that is what they see. In fact, one of their you know, major icons is this uh, sort of very strange looking, sort of silly face. Like if we had an emoji, it would be the one with the tongue sticking out the side. Right? So there is this element of, of humor, and, and I think. Um, and maybe, in part, it's, I mean, they're influenced by Dada. Um, and so the sort of absurdity, uh, I think, is, is the affect that's sort of related to that sort of use and very, I would say, um, very conscientious influence of, 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 of humor, or in, incorporation of humor into their work. Um, I tend, so the piece that I, 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 I use as an example is not humorous in the least, in fact it's a, it's a political commentary. So he, this is in 1968 um, and he, um, he says that in particular he um, wanted to show that guns could be used for other purposes than killing people. Um, and so um, I think I probably haven't explored sort of the more sort of Dada-esque kind of uh, elements of, of Fluxes, and maybe that's you know a weakness because I have certain things that I gravitate towards that are more sort of in line with the things that I'm trying to talk about. Um, so that's my answer. <laughs> well, again, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.